future trends, deep insights, industry leaders. This is the iGaming Next podcast with your host, Heidi Loftus. Hi, Carl. Carl Gregg. Hi, Heidi. Thank you for having me. This is going to be a fantastically interesting uh, session uh, where we will talk about coaching, Carl. Uh, I just have to say, reading your bio and how you introduce yourself, you kind of end off with, instead of getting very irritated at the Maltese traffic, you choose to use this time as you know, reflection time or to think. Very true. Uh, I, I get know. quite frustrated with the traffic um, and also sometimes listening to the radio. It's not my best. It kind of works me off the wrong way. So I make use of this time to learn something new. So I have a list of various podcasts which I listen to. And it's an opportunity for me to see different perspectives, not necessarily always in relation to my work, uh, but uh, get other people's point of view. Um, so podcasts, when I have the kids with me, we listen to podcasts. Um, I have two daughters, so they're, the podcast is called Rebel Girls. Um, so helping them to be more rebel and going against the flow, if you like. Um, and I listen to stuff which either helps me to think about myself, think about other things and different perspectives. Um, so various podcasts, various uh, topics. <laughs> Oh, interesting already here. So you are an ACC certified coach uh, and certified, I mean, by the ICF, International Coaching Federation. Basically, the, the world's biggest coaching organ has certified you uh, as an ACC, Associate Certified Coach. Um, with this certification, do you feel any difference in terms of how you're being responded to by clients or prospects out there? So I think what I should say is that um, this gives me an element of a code of ethics to focus on. Um, so whilst I don't think there is much of a difference, um, the coaching world is, um, if you like, very unregulated, so to say. Uh, but I felt I need to do this uh, for myself as an aspect of mm -hmm. maybe offering an element of quality. So uh, to do the ACC, for example, I, record, I had to record a number of sessions and uh, send a recording. And I'm currently in the process of doing the same uh, to go for the next level, the PCC. Um, so what I must say is that in the process, this gave me um, further learning, understanding more what I can do differently or better. Uh, definitely an aspect of improved confidence. I think that was the biggest for me. Um, so giving me the confidence that I, I have, if you like, that uh, that label, that uh, quality mark, so to say. Um, however, in my practice, what it has given me as well is an element of recognition. So I've also joined Better Up and I'm doing coaching for companies there, companies that are within the Fortune 500 or global Fortune 500 companies as well. Um, so this gives me the opportunity, you know, to coach people from an international perspective and also uh, caliber of companies as well. And that wouldn't have been possible had I not uh, done, if you like, this certification. Exactly, exactly. No, I think uh, exactly what you're saying, it gives the credibility. Uh, I mean, the, the standards of ethics that they put out there and uh, especially around confidentiality, but how we as coaches need to act professional and sort of keep our standards high. Uh, and if we don't, we can be expelled, basically. We lose our, not license, but uh, the certification. Correct. So it's, it's highly regulated in that sense. It's, it um, it's, 
it's fantastic that you're doing the PCC. I'm currently doing the course. Uh, it's a year long course as well on the, on that level. So we, we've already spoken, you and I, quite a lot about this, <laughs> but I think that we remain in touch on these subjects moving forward. Very true. Um, myself, I'm taking the portfolio route, which is slightly different, where I um, have done a number of coaching hours, now close to 1,000 hours of coaching and constantly further development through various courses and conferences that I attend. Yes. <laughs> I want to talk to you about the Lego uh, certification that you have. Sure. Uh, that I saw on your website, but I leave it. That, I leave that. I don't. I just don't want to leave you hanging. And the the internal landscape of uh, um, Carl Greck just yet. Um, when it comes to uh, motivation, but also like this, this kind of self improvement as as you're talking about having undergone these courses yourself and the hours of coaching. You start learning things about yourself and self-reflection is on a different level of awareness. Um, what I'm thinking, of, is there anything that you can share with us in terms of an area in yourself that you wanted to improve and how you set that goal and how you keep it measurable and sort of how that process has been for you? Sure. Um, and two examples come to mind right away once you're mentioning this. Uh, one aspect was the resilience aspect a few years ago. Uh, or I could go even a bit further. Um, I was once uh, doing some shopping with my wife and I looked my, at myself in the mirror and I didn't like the, if you like, what I saw in the mirror. I said, I have to do something about it. So uh, that got me to do some fitness and I started to do some uh, half marathons. Um, after that, uh, and I had done a few half marathons, I felt I achieved what I wanted to achieve and I got lazy again. Um, so I had to challenge myself, if you like, and kick myself a little bit in the butt to take on the next challenge. And then I did a full marathon, uh, 42 kilometers. What I wanted to get from through that was not to become an athlete, definitely not. Um, it was, if you like, developing my resilience um, yeah. being able to, if you like, uh, challenge myself to go for a tough um, challenge um, and uh, constantly, if you like, checking in with myself and making sure I do the runs I need to do to be able to reach that fitness level that is required to, to get to do a full marathon. Um, so that is one aspect. Another example is um, I recently started my own business. I know that I'm not, if you like, the sales type of person. So I might keep myself back when it comes to reaching out to individuals and people. So what I did was I joined a networking group um, and that gave me, if you like, the opportunity to check in on a weekly basis with people. Um, whilst I didn't have to in a way, but I felt I needed to, to make sure I, I give my best, was constantly um, showing what I have done, how many um, members I have met over the week, how many, if you like, referrals I have passed on uh, during the week. So that gave me, if you like, that uh, further opportunity to constantly uh, push myself um, to reach out to individuals, to constantly meet different people. Um, and it's, I think it's having these practices in your life, creating a bit of a routine or a ritual uh, with these different aspects. So um, I like to, uh, I'm the practical type of person, so I like to think of what is the one thing I can improve and then focus on that. Uh, once I have improved it and uh, constantly keeping it up, then it's a matter of uh, keeping up, if you like, those habits that you've put together and put for yourself. Mm. Increasing the, the self-discipline on small adjustments, doable yes. adjustments. So it, what it requires is, if you like, being self-aware, being aware of yourself and mm. who you are. Um, but that comes after, doesn't it? So you're standing there, you're looking at yourself mm -hmm. in the mirror. What's the motivation point here, would you say? Is it you looking at your own reflection going, that can't be, you know, <laughs> it? Or does, does it come from internal in terms of when you start reading about fitness or marathon? When, when does the actual motivation kick in? I think it's a mix of uh, things for me, um, both from the aspect of that reflection, seeing, you know, is this the person who I, I have become? If you like, a mirror gives you the opportunity to see things one way. Uh, and thinking of this, it reminds me as well of 
an image that um, I have seen on social media, you know, where you see the men looking at themselves in the mirror and they see, you know, this big tough guy and the women looking at themselves and they see something totally different. Um, whereas uh, sometimes men tend to see things very differently and maybe they see a better version, if you like, of themselves when in react uh, and actually it might not be um, the aspect. So um, I like to look at myself uh, or maybe let me share. Uh, my dad had um, uh, once told us, you know, this expression, he said, um, we're merely not the person who, you know, you can wear whatever you want, but it's not who you are. It's uh, if you like your values uh, that you bring to the table. It's um, your habits. Um, so that resonated very much with me. And it's constantly, if you like, keeping myself in check and seeing what am I doing? What could I do differently or better? Um, an instant this morning with my kids, whilst we were waiting for the school van, you know, uh, one of my daughters told my other daughter, you always keep us back. You know, you're always very slow in doing things, etc." So then I said, OK, then what are what could you consider doing to be a little bit faster? And she said, oh, I don't know. Then I jumped to the other sister who actually gave the comment, you know, and asked her, what do you think she could do? And we came to a conclusion where they could switch places, you know, and uh, the sister who wanted to be out faster could be at the edge of the seat rather than next to the window. <laughs> Are they aware of that you're coaching them? No, no. <laughs> and indirectly, maybe I am. But of course, um, the coaching skills, if you like, are skills that we have and we all have and we can make use of. Sometimes, you know, we, say, we speak about coaching and we make it this big thing. But potentially, um, you can use coaching questions to get people to realize and learn more about themselves. Mm. Um. Absolutely. <laughs> we are also going to cover the subject of emotional intelligence. So that's where you as a father can also come in and sort of read what's happening uh, internally in the family. Mm -hmm. what's what's uh, what's the definition for you of emotional intelligence so a very simple definition is how we show up so how we come across to others um, of course in doing that you need to first of all uh, be aware of yourself and how um, you control and you manage your own emotions um, in fact just before this call I was coaching someone who feels that he you know uh, blurts off and he totally escalates situations when Deep down, he realizes that he's over-exaggerating maybe in his actions. Mm. Um, but before he does that, potentially there are a number of triggers inside him that he must feel. You know, when uh, we get to get angry, we would tend to feel our blood boiling, our skin, maybe goosebumps, so to say, perhaps sweat as well. And maybe potentially you can even feel your face getting redder and redder or your fists, you know, clinging together. Um, so if you are aware of yourself and you're aware of... Uh, these emotions that you're feeling, you can potentially prevent um, blurting off or doing things that, you know, later on you might um, regret. Um, so it's like, if you like that knee jerk reaction, when we go to the doctor and the doctor uh, hits our knee with uh, his hammer and then our knee goes up that way, that's the knee jerk reaction. But as individuals, we have a conscious, we, we also can foresee and imagine um, what are the consequences that if I get angry, if I blurt out, what, what's going to happen? And potentially I might even say things that I might regret later. I might um, impact negatively a, a relationship that I might have, which I don't want to, if you like, uh, negatively impact. So it's definitely starting off with your own self-awareness, being aware of yourself. And secondly, how you come across to individuals. Um, it reminds me of an instance. Actually, I was actually in Sweden on a, um, a leadership uh, training camp, so to say. And we were a group of leaders from the same voluntary organization, um, international, uh, so from different areas. And this person uh, constantly wanted to win and push the team, you know, to achieve results. But in doing so, she was rubbing people the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's that is what reaction do I have on others? How am I uh, impacting others? Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to be aware of. 
I tend to use some assessments um, in, with individuals uh, because I feel that mm-hmm. we can get our self-awareness, yes, from others, but also uh, these assessments help to give you, if you like, that aha moment. Uh, the first time I did an assessment on myself, or well, it was like Big Brother is watching, you know, and uh, Big Brother knew so much more about me. Um, and these are all How based are these on- assessments actually carried out? I saw, I saw uh, you had posted a... Um, Uh, an article on uh, uh, LinkedIn about this as well, Uh, Mm -hmm. emotional culture. Are we talking about the same thing here now with the assessments? Um, That is another assessment, and that focuses mostly on the culture within the organization. Uh, But Mm -hmm. assessments work similarly. So the assessments specifically I'm referring to at this stage are individual assessments. And one example is the Genos uh, assessment, for example, where you could either do a self, so it's a a self-reflection, so, and in doing that, it doesn't f- show, am I emotion intelligent or not? Am I capable of being emotion intelligent or not? What it shows is uh, where I currently rate myself on this particular area and where I, I should rate myself and, or where I would like to be, what I should expect of myself. And that shows an element of a gap. And this is the gap, if you like, of uh, personal development where we could focus on. Of course, if you do that either as a 180, so that includes maybe getting your peers um, or your direct reports responding to this assessment, or a 360, where you have your boss, your peers, and your direct reports giving you all feedback. And all these groups uh, would give you feedback of how they see you. Um, we all see each other in different light, if you like. So my boss would see me one way, my peers would see me in a different uh, light. And my direct reports would see me differently. So that's why we don't put everybody, if you like, in the same uh, bag. We kind of separate them. And that allows that individual, first of all, to identify uh, where they're currently showing up or how they're coming across to others. And secondly, um, what could I do or what are the focus areas I should focus on mostly to gain most impact? Of course, there's always an element of deciding, you know, should I focus on my strengths or are there um, areas that I'm maybe not as strong as that I should focus on? Definitely focus on your strengths sometimes is is quickest win, because if you improve 1% in your strength, um, it's going to be a big difference. But if you improve 1%, if you like on a weakness or a behavior you're not so strong at, the difference might be small. However, I'm not saying do not focus on those weaknesses, so to say, or those behaviors which you keep away from. Um, They're going to make a difference, of course. Companies do 360 uh, as a standard, or it's it's increasingly so, uh, 360 reviews. Have you heard about companies? Do you have any sort of, or have you been part of a 720 where sort of the outside of work is also taken into consideration. So if you take uh, the uh, the partner uh, of a person being being the boss, <laughs> uh, you take the peers, so that's the friends, and you take the people that report into this person, so that would be the mm-hmm. children, uh, to also take in personal aspects uh, and feedback on the on the person in the private life. Have you have you any? Have you seen this? Um, actually, with one client, he did use, yes, his friends and his partner uh, to give him some feedback. Um, if I could, and there we use the 360 feedback, so it was great to do that. When I did it myself, I put in my partner, I, uh, two sisters actually of mine, and some friends, but I put the ball in one bag. Uh, so the consistency there uh, was not... Uh, reflected in the sense that uh, my wife sees me one way, my friends see me a different way, and my sisters would see me in a different light. So that's why it's important if you like to do that distinction. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, uh, but be cautious in choosing your children to rate you, depending on their ages. Maybe if they're in their (laughs) teens, potentially yes, and maybe it depends as well on uh, what has happened before (laughs) you've asked them to rate you as well, Um, if you see yourself in good light. Uh, but so we, we actually did this uh, at yeah. home uh, yeah. because I'm, I'm in the middle of uh, Immunity to Change, uh, uh, the Keegan book right now. And on this subject, uh, and since we were locked in the entire mm-hmm. last week, uh, the full family had COVID, um, 
we did a set of rules, respect each other in this and this way to sort of get everyone's uh, <laughs> engagement. And I think it's due time that we actually do this. So this came well served. Um, but then we also did try to identify each other's big thing. And this is obviously the not the strength, but the weakness, like what's daddy's big thing, what's mommy's big thing, and what's my big thing. So, and they are remarkably easy to identify. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and we could all agree. Uh, so it's, uh, I think uh, now mm -hmm. we can point to, at each other and say, that's your big thing. <laughs> so it's, it's quite interesting, mm -hmm. uh, but that's working with uh, lesser uh, strengths and actually areas of improvement. But hopefully, um, uh, this is where, least, if I could jump in here, is yeah. how you show up to your family. So how you currently show up and maybe what rubs them if you like the wrong way. Um, so being aware of that, you'd be more cautious and maybe keep it a bit uh, mm. back or attentive. So to Exactly. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, we are different people in different settings and with different group of constellations. And being closed off in one area definitely adds... <laughs> The stress levels as well. <laughs> Other kinds of stress levels, yeah. absolutely. Um, so let's go, go back to the work uh, and not my COVID uh, setting. <laughs> um, so work, emotional culture, um, emotional culture, but also sort of go, let's go back even to coaching at the company. If you're a company, you haven't really tested coaching before, Obviously, we can all read about it. What's the positive things? Increased productivity, a more resilient staff, uh, easier to prioritize, etc. But what would you suggest is the best way for a company to go on about starting to look into coaching? Interesting question. Um, definitely, I would suggest looking for coaches that fit uh, the company in the sense that uh, that might be aligned as well with the culture. Um, so it's important that there is definitely that good uh, chemistry aspect. So I think it's uh, good to keep in mind the chemistry aspect with that individual and the company. I think it's important to create uh, some form of understanding on what the company is expecting from the coach. Uh, both from the aspect of information back after the coach happens, what are the objectives that they'd like to, to achieve, um, and then identify, uh, if you like, what the coach's needs are. Um, so from the aspect of, if I were to put the coach's hat on, um, I, I would need to, first of all, ensure that I achieve the objectives of the company, so why is the company engaging in this uh, coaching process? Is it part of a leadership development program? Is it part of a change culture? Has it realized that maybe uh, the team are a bit stressed and worked out um, and need uh, to focus on, you know, uh, supporting their team? Um, and then I also need to look at the individual's uh, perspective, so the coach's perspective. So, and what objectives do they want to achieve? Um, I definitely need to try to as well align this. So there are times in some coaching relationships where I would say uh, this is within our uh, scope and this is what we need to focus on. And this might not be within our scope. Um, coaching is confidential. So when I'm coaching the client, the client needs to feel safe and needs to feel that they can share whatever uh, they need to share uh, within that context. Um, so that's why it's important, I think, to also have an element of goals that we're going to focus on achieving. So by we're starting the coaching, let's say today, by the end date. So let's say in three months time, this is what we want, the difference we want to see. Um, and that could come both of you like from the assessments aspect, so identify what are the needs or um, the company's intention. I also need to agree with the company on what they want to get out of this coaching mm -hmm. and what information they want back uh, from mm. me. So definitely always keeping in mind that confidentiality aspect with the individual, because if I break that, then uh, the coachee will not trust me. Um, so the a person will not be open um, to share uh, areas of focus or needs. Um, I think I think that is what's really important to, to keep in mind. 
Um, Have you ended up in situations where the the company, uh, be it the HR department or uh, the CEO or the orderer, uh, has requested feedback from you that you could not share? Um, I haven't really, uh, but there were moments when I felt I, I need to share this and I felt, uh, what should I do? So in mm. that context, what I did was, first of all, I had an open conversation with the individual I was coaching. And I told him this, I think this is something that um, should be shared. Um, and I encouraged the participant or the coachee to share it directly. Um, or I also offered that support that we could do this together. So I can join you in this conversation and we can do this together. Um, it depends, I guess, on the situation, it depends on the objectives. Um, but all this, that that dilemma, mm -hmm. if you say, uh, would obviously not be there depending on how well you prepare the organization in advance. So I can understand if organizations or companies goes in thinking, okay, we're going to have a coach. We find the unique, best identified coach to each and every coachee in the company. And then we expect results. But in reality, the coach will not be able to share any details, hardly in general, the feedback mm -hmm. from the coachees. This is made in strict confidentiality. Mm -hmm. And the CEO or the company having the coach uh, taken in have to realize already in the beginning, we're messing with people's inner you know, emotions, but most of all, thoughts you know mm -hmm. they start to actually self-reflect and mm -hmm. you know they come up with new ideas or solutions to something that they haven't really thought of so the the outcome is totally unpredictable mm -hmm. what i suggest is that the company keeps whether it's a ceo or whoever is um, the direct mm -hmm. uh, boss of that person a regular touch points i guess it's also like training you know um, you go in to do some training and this is the intention of the training and then you leave the training and go back to work and it's like um, another normal day and nothing else changes. The likelihood of you implementing that training is very little. Um, however, if there is that support and communication directly from the boss or the CEO um, and the CEO or boss is constantly checking in with this individual, uh, then it's like that they're going to improve their relationship as well. And the person is going to be ready to share a number of aspects. Mm. Um, but it very, first of all, there are a number of, if you like, gray areas. So there's no black and white, I would say here. Um, so it very much depends on what the need is. Mm. But just to give an example, this is like if you were to do an emotional, uh, sorry, uh, an engagement survey with the team members uh, to see how engaged are they at the place of work. If you do this and you identify, you know, an area that you need to improve on, um, if you try to do something about it, then it's likely you're going to improve the trust with these employees and they're going to say, okay, it's great. We were given the opportunity to do this engagement survey and our feedback was taken on board and something has changed. Unless we're told this and this cannot be done because of this and these are current our restrictions and whether it is legal or or because of the current circumstances we are in, whatever. Um, and the likelihood is that these team members, having had that reason, will take on the next engagement survey when it comes along. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if I do, you do an engagement survey and people do not respond and you do not take any feedback whatsoever and it's just uh, like nothing has happened, then it's likely that these team members will not trust you and be ready to share that feedback again with you in future upcoming surveys. You know, why make myself vulnerable? Why share this feedback uh, when nothing is going to be done? Exactly. Uh, so it's keeping these aspects in mind, you know, the confidentiality aspect, keeping in mind uh, the respect and the trust uh, for people. Uh, quite a number of aspects we can move into here, but I'm not yeah, sure. Exactly. Let me leave it for your next covered. question. <laughs> Uh, all covered uh, within the uh, emotional intelligence, uh, isn't it? Why why would you say that emotional intelligence discussions have increased so much lately? I think we have realized that 
Um, whereas in the past, we would focus more on people's intelligence and um, coming to the workplace and the more intelligent we have our team members, the better. And nowadays, it's not just about that. Um, computers, if you like, and uh, technology has advanced, so it's doing a lot of, if you like, that that uh, work, technical work, et cetera. Um, so emotional intelligence is how we uh, work together as we uh, previously, if you like, um, defined it. So um, it, when we compare, for example, high performance workplaces, um, the likelihood is that the manager, leader, CEO is highly emotion intelligent. So there he gets the best out of people because people feel uh, comfortable, they feel that they're trusted, they feel they can uh, share things. When we have those positive feelings, there is more likelihood that we're going to give our best and, and possibly even more at times. But if we were to compare maybe low performance workplaces where and maybe the manager doesn't trust, the manager tells you what to do and you just have to do it and you don't have your uh, creativity or you're not allowed, if you like, to share your ideas and your thoughts and do, how to do things in such a way, then it's likely that you feel that you're not giving your best. You feel there's something missing and you're just, if you like, a number. Uh, and that is where, if you like, uh, we can have a low uh, performance workplace where people uh, or the managers are less, if you like, emotional intelligence, so they don't get the best out of people. Mm. And so that is why I would think emotional intelligence has become so important. Mm -hmm. Is that when you pull the Lego? Uh, the, what would you say? Lego, so Lego series play um, can bring in a little bit of this. So um, the concept of Lego is... Whereas in a meeting would have people who are engaged and sharing their ideas and their thoughts. Um, many times it's, if you like the 80, 20 rule, we have 20% of the people who are participating and 80% might be relaxed or, or laid back. So we don't have full participation. So Lego, it gets you to build and create your own, if you like building, which then you can explain um, in your own words. So it's like giving your brain the hands to create, to develop, and then you can um, give an example by what you've built. So Lego, if you like, puts that 100% input by everybody. So everybody builds and everybody has um, or shares their, their say. So the concept is used on a number of aspects. I wouldn't use it 100% for learning, although you could take some learning out of it. Uh, but it, uh, for example, identifying communication uh, boundaries or uh, breakages in, in the process. So whereas rather than me telling you, Heidi, you know, you do this and you do that, huh? I'm building a model and I can say these are the obstacles, this is what happens. And um, if you like letting it out in a little figure, figure of a <laughs> Lego figure, so to say, um, and explaining. How, how, how old would you say that this concept is? This concept is, I would say, uh, 15 years old or something like that. Um, so the idea had started off in Lego. So they said, how can we develop Lego to, you know, expand or create maybe a diversified use for Lego? And then it was studied within one of the universities in Denmark, um, where they created a number of uh, workshops and developed the process. Um, but Lego never saw it as potentially an opportunity for improving in uh, profitability, etc. So then, um, it, if you like, Lego Series Play is a bit of an open source aspect. So mm -hmm. the concept is there, it's been developed, um, and anybody can use it. Yeah. Definitely it requires uh, some facilitation, know-how, if you like, that can easily be developed. Besides, of course, so being the Lego. <laughs> Exactly. So you say you're in this room, you're with these people, and uh, we have this project to solve. Okay. And everyone is given a bag of Lego pieces. When, and you give them X amount of time to build, and then we report back on what it is that we have built. Uh, when, when would you say that there is a breakthrough? What's the moment of breakthrough? that this was actually successful? That's a great question. Um, so if I could take us back a little bit, so the way Lego would work is that we would have 
if you like, a challenge or a focus. So this is our focus and this is what we want to achieve. We will not necessarily have the answers, definitely not. Uh, but many times we would structure it in a way that there would be one question and then um, the individual will, would build an individual build, uh, which would contribute to um, the potentially getting us closer to the, to the decision. Um, so there is a mix of individual builds, a mix of group builds, and mix of sharing ideas. So what happens is that uh, when you build, we then capture that image, the, that uh, that build in an image, or it's placed uh, somewhere in the room, with a phrase or a, a word that would uh, remind us of this. Um, and then in the process, if you like, uh, people would build together, they'd share ideas, they'd contribute to ideas, they'd identify in their opinion, the best idea, and then they might continuously uh, building and expanding on that idea. Um, so it would vary, of course, uh, but it could take a few hours. It could take even a few days. But uh, definitely, it's always, always keeping in mind what are the resources we have available, what's the time we have available, and and what's our focus. Um, so what do we want to achieve through through this result? In general, people feel that this is a, a fun. Thing, I can imagine. Yes, definitely. There's an element of fun to it. Um, it brings us back to our childhood. And that is one of the reasons why I decided to embrace uh, this concept, because uh, I'm considered as more of the, the serious type and not the, the fun loving type. And I realized that there was something missing. So I needed to inject some element of fun in this. Uh, in fact, just on my desk, I, I have this uh, Lego duck. Okay, um, so <laughs> that's your of, solution to everything. <laughs> not always, <laughs> although uh, sometimes in a, I'm in a coaching session and the child comes and I have something to show <laughs> or, or in a meeting. Um, so this Lego duck, for example, is six blocks. Um, so one of the activities is giving the participants uh, six blocks to build a duck. Now, this is one way of building a duck, probably, um, and I'm not um, mathematical, especially at this time of the morning. Uh, but we, we probably can generate, uh, we'll find someone who's good at maths, how many different types of ducks based on the pieces we can create. But I've seen all, all form of ducks. So the reason why I use this is it helps people, if you like, to get um, some ideas, it, uh, to build something uh, there and then. And there we can touch on the diversity of the ducks. You know, how many, are ducks the same or ducks different? Um, it gets people even to play and to feel something and... In the process, they're thinking and you know coming up with ideas. So, uh, the concept of Lego brings a lot, uh, not only from the fun aspect, but from the thinking and the thought process, and then considering different options. And it can get lead you then into different topics. Nice, <laughs> uh, interesting. Uh, we're actually planning to uh, a little trip to uh, Legoland in uh, in Denmark this summer, so that might be a concept that we then bring home to further develop. <laughs> the the little group of four back home. Um, Carl, um, I think it's time for us to sort of start rounding up a little bit. Sure. Um, what have we not covered? Uh, if there's anything that you can think of that, oh, I didn't, didn't even lift this up. And also, I want to know, how do you stay sort of updated? What... Uh, Apart from your podcast in the morning, what uh, what do you do to mm. be modern? So uh, I, I'm i a bit of a reader, so I tend to try to identify some time, whether in the day or in the week, to do some reading. Um, now, reading could either be in physical books. So I have a number of books on my shelf, which I need to or I want to read. <laughs> so I need to put some challenges there. So maybe that is my next uh, goal for myself, a number of pages per day. Uh, to read. Ah, another improve <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> identified area. Yeah, improvement area. Improvement area. Um, so reading, following, um, you know, various uh, different uh, topics. Um, I tend to find LinkedIn very beneficial as well. The fact that I'm a member of Better Up, um, which is this coaching platform, um, is constantly updating with various things. So um, this week, or was it last week? Uh, there was a conference on inner work, so focusing on yourself and what you need to do to improve, for example, you know, and it came up with a number of aspects. So some aspects would be, you know, the meditation, the journaling and the self-reflection. Uh, then there is the aspect of 
um, going for walks, taking breaks and all this. Um, so various aspects. I try to attend conferences. Um, today, there is so much knowledge available and also some, yes, you need to pay for, but some you can also get for free. Um, so maybe subscribing to various um, uh, newsletters and uh, things that come to the mailbox, you know, and, and you, mm. you check in every now and again. So I, I tend to uh, open up to various, various uh, things where I could get knowledge. Also, I think what I should say is collaborating with others mm. um, and collaborating with people who potentially are or you feel are better than you. Um, and that is what challenges me and helps me to become better. So I have a few collaborations with a few people where we work on projects together and we keep, if you like, each other in check and constantly um, bouncing off ideas, you know, and helping each other improve. Uh, so. Something you said there um, sort of made me think of what we talked about in the beginning. Uh, what actually brings on motivation? Seeing yourself in the reflection or sort of the way there. And when you talk about the thing that, uh, that, that keeps you updated, these are things that also inspires, right? So uh, when I hear you talking about these things, uh, about new insights or new learnings, they motivate me, but I have no idea about the self-reflection, saying the goal is not identified, but there is an improved uh, adjustment in a specific area because there is a motivation. So the goal has not yet been identified, but I'm still motivated because of sort of the inner learnings mm -hmm. uh, or inspiration from outside. There's a lot out there and lots of things we could always do to improve ourselves. But I like to, what I have realized, and definitely this is also proven, is that if you have too many goals, let's say you have 10 goals, there is the diminishing return. So the likelihood of you achieving those 10 goals is remote um, and very impossible. Um, but if you were to focus on one, two, or maximum three goals, there's more of a chance of you achieving them. So I tend okay. to try to focus on that one, two, or three um, at the max. Once I feel I'm comfortable with it, then I um, I take something else on. Um, but I think I'm not sure if this is what you were mentioning as well. Is I like I have realized that. Yeah, I think I think it is like uh, you know the the, the the matter of creating new habits. Mm -hmm. Once they're in, they're in. And making yourself <laughs> a little bit uncomfortable. Um, mm. So if we become too comfortable in, in our ways, then it's likely that we're not going to improve or get better. If you feel a little bit more uncomfortable, uh, then it is likely that you're going to improve. Um, I have taught myself this along the way, and um, I realize that it really helps, you know, making yourself feel a little bit uncomfortable. It accelerates, uh, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Having uh, come to a certain sort of self-awareness or a uh, set of thoughts, it just keeps it coming quicker and quicker. Mm -hmm. Carl. You are also joining our HR Connect session on the emotional intelligence topic. Uh, so for that, I am super grateful. And I know that my HR colleagues in the team are as well. Uh, and on top of that, uh, we will continue talking. Uh, and for this time, I am very happy to have had you here. Thank you, Thank Heidi. You so Thank much. you for this opportunity. Um, definitely, as you mentioned, if we continue, we'll probably keep on for, for a few hours. So it's great to wrap up. And <laughs> exactly. Thank you for the invitation. I look forward to supporting uh, within the HR Connect. Um, I'll try to ensure that it is fun, yet practical, that we can take something out of it. Amazing. Amazing. Grazie. Keep well. Take I cannot care. reply in Swedish as yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'll teach you. It's fine. Bye, Carl. Bye -bye. Thank you.